of the teaching pastors here, and as I was watching that for the third time this morning, I thought, you know, that's a hard bumper video to follow. <laughs> you feel like, okay, so let's pray and you can go. It's very powerful. Thanks for being here this morning. Uh, for those of you that are online and decided not like these faithful people to brave the rain <laughs> and come out, I hope you're enjoying your coffee right now. <laughs> Love that you're here this morning. Thought to myself um, that in John 1 it says that Jesus was a light and the darkness will never overcome it. So if any of you have been in a dark place this week or feel like, you know, I'm not sure if I'm seeing really clearly what the future is, the Bible says that Jesus is the light and the darkness has not overcome it. So there's this balance between using the minds that God gives us to think our way sometimes out of a situation and not just feel our way out of a situation. But at the same time, be worshiping the Jesus who's in you. Because sometimes the answer to our issue or our darkness is not so much the fix, but just Jesus. Just Jesus. I read something this week that struck me that um, encouraged those of faith to be enveloped in the light of Christ. Christ makes me think of being so near to him that I'm just sort of lost in that light. If people were to see, look and see where's Pete or where's one of you, we're just lost in the light and then we just move with that light wherever it goes. So in him there is light and the darkness has not overcome it. And uh, perhaps that's the only thing some of you might need this morning. So I want to start there. Let me say a word of prayer and let's get into God's word. Our Jesus, how we need you. And Lord, in a world of distraction, where our minds and our hearts and our souls are racing, Lord, would you help us to breathe and to take in what you have for us this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. Have you ever had somebody say to you, I'm in a tough season? I hear that around the church a lot, and I think it's because we know in Ecclesiastes it says there is a time and a season for everything. And somebody will say, well, I'm in a tough season. But if they were honest, they might say, well, what that really means is I got a mountain of a debt, and I don't have the kind of income that's going to get me out of it any time soon, and it feels very daunting. They might not even like the job they're in. They might have a court date for speeding. They might be in a difficult relationship, and all of it is stressing their bodies, and their bodies are breaking down. So they say, I'm in a tough season. But it sounds like to me that you're on the Titanic. <laughs> but I get it. We don't want people to think, we can't handle it. I'll figure it out. Or that somehow our faith is faith light. I mean, I'm always stretching the truth when I go to my doctor or my dentist. They want to know if I'm taking care of myself. I said, absolutely. Are you working out? Uh-huh. And they might say, well, what do you do? Well, three days a week, I go from my kitchen to the grill and put more basting on my pork chops. Mm, mm, mm. Or my dentist. You have, a lot of us don't like going to the dentist. And if you're a dentist here, I love you. Because really, it, it, you help us very much. But, you know, when you ask the question... Um, do you floss? It's like asking me, am I a sinner? Absolutely, I'm a <laughs> sinner. I mean, you'd feel convicted because you're not really flossing like you should. So I say, yeah, I'm flossing, except for my birthday and every day that's not my birthday. And <clears throat> so I thought I was going to preach a nice little sermon this morning to help us to feel good about God and to feel good about ourselves, to encourage us but as we look at our text this morning, I think we need to say honestly to one another, and I think the text reads us as much as we read it, I think the te text tells us that we're not taking care of our souls.
If we're honest, we're not well. We're addicted. I'm not addicted. We are so immersed in the culture and on our screens that we believe in a higher power, but it is just a spoke on our wheel. It is not the center of our lives. How do I know this? Could I know that about me? We live anxiously. We, leave, we, we live at a frenetic pace. Oh, we, we may have a day off and walk the city like I did yesterday, and it's a nice day, and there's a lot of people out, but our minds keep racing. And it's hard to find stillness interiorly. And the sages and the counselors of this day say, well, go have fun and, and gratify. Gratify your human desires. I heard an ad the other day that said, hey, you know, you can refi your house because you can then pay off your credit card and get ready for Christmas. I thought, man, I want to hit that guy. <laughs> so we can get in more debt. That kind of counsel that we can arrive at our full humanness by gratifying anything that we need has led to misery and loneliness for millions of people, including me. And whether you sit here this morning and you believe in God or not, all of us, I should give some grace here. Most of us have anchored our souls and have given too much time in the shifting sands of the latest trend. And sometimes it's even the Christian trend. Here's the book that, that'll... The superficial things in our society... And coming into a body of people like this once a week is not enough to hold you in the depths. A divided soul is a defeated soul. It's not neutral. And I think we need a doctor. (laughs) So I want to look at Jeremiah this morning an Old Testament prophet. I'll call him Dr. Jeremiah for us. And then we're going to see the counsel of Psalm 16, or excuse me, Psalm 46, that affirms what Jeremiah is saying. See, Jeremiah was a soul doctor. He was a prophet, and most Old Testament prophets people did not like because they were saying things to the people that just was going against the grain of the culture, against the grain of the society, and they didn't like it. Jeremiah was a, a, a doctor of the human condition, but he had a bad bedside manner. He didn't help us to feel very good. He said to a nation to put their trust in idols, what are you doing? <laughs> There is only one God that made you, and not this wooden thing or metal thing or melted down good thing and gold thing. And he said, the human heart is sick. Oh, I'm not sick. The human heart is sick, he said, and only God can heal it. And he was calling people to a life of significance that he knew God was calling him to do. And the wisdom of Psalm 16 echoes that cry. I think in our culture we have too many celebrities and we don't have enough saints. We're going to do some celebrity watching this this afternoon, aren't we? Listen to what Jeremiah says to his people. And not just people 2,000 years ago, but for us today. I'm going to set it up. 
by a little bit of um, a text that's before the text we're going to read that's in your worship guide and on the screen. If you have your Bibles, you can open up to Jeremiah 6. And Jeremiah sets up what he's about to say by saying this, the prophets of the world practice deceit. So, so like this was written a long time ago, and I think, oh, that was, that's, you know, that's kind of poetic, and he said, no, no, let, let, let's put it in our day. The prophets of the world practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. You're not sick. Peace, peace, they say, and there's no peace. And this is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. We are at a crossroads, church. And ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, nope. We won't walk in it. No, we'll give it a day, a week. We'll give it a few hours. But to live a life of sacred rhythm? Mm Mm-mm. Too much. So what do we believe? Then what is our way of living if it's not enveloped in the light of Jesus Christ? We're in a series called Sacred Rhythms. We're calling people of faith and we're calling people that are exploring the faith to say, put your, put your chips in on a God who loves you. Because we believe that the contemporary things in life are not enough to hold you in the depths. I was reading before coming in this morning a little book called The Preacher's Catechism. And in the chapter that I was reading this morning, it talked about loving people well. And I thought, Lord, I don't know if this message is consistent. I I do want to love people well, but it feels like a a message of, of judgment from Jeremiah. But even as we consider that, I think you want somebody to tell you the truth. You want people to say, I love you. I love you. And it makes me sad that my soul and our souls are so divided. And I think there's so much more. I think that God is calling us to a life of significance and we're missing it. I don't want to miss it. I think at the end of life, we say things that we wish we would have done or we want to do or we express our great love for people and that's how we should be living every day. And for me to say that and for you to leave here and feel like, okay, I'll I'll try to do it again, that doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. So what we can do is pray for one another. I'm not under any illusion that some inspirational message will change a person's life because we're so engrossed in the patterns that we are. So we need to pray for one another. That's how revival comes. That's how renewal comes. Not through more strategy, but through prayer. Trying to establish some rhythms where we stay near to Jesus. I mean, our Apple wristwatch that many of us have or our, smart, our smartphones, they can tell us a time, they can send an email, we can make a phone call on it, we can connect on social media, but it can't tell us how we're doing in life or what season of life you're in or why all these images are making me still feel so lonely. They can't tell us when the pain will end or where to find real hope. We live busy lives, friends. And if we're not thoughtful, if we can't just sit still and be a person, which is really hard for me to be, then we'll get caught up 
in the unreflective river of this culture. And we're gonna miss beauty. We're just gonna miss it. And we're gonna miss knowing that God said, who created the world, that he put creativity in you, and you're gonna miss something that he has for you. In a moment, when you notice a person walking by, and you say something, or you see something, and this is why they call it spiritual discipline, right? Because it's a discipline. <laughs> it's like we need to put guardrails back up for our soul. All of us are just driving off the Bay Bridge into the water. <laughs> so Jeremiah and the Psalms say, stop, stop. Please stop. You're at a crossroads. Considered an ancient pathway. It's a good way. And then begin to walk in it. Now, there's nothing wrong with smartphones or social media. They're an inanimate object. Well, maybe that's a point. They don't got a heart. And sometimes they can help connect us, and they can be a great tool. But a steady diet of it will starve our soul. So what's going to hold us in the depths? What do you believe? What, what is your creed? Oh, and I know I'm having fun with it, but I, I, think, I think the creed of the culture might say, much like the Nicene Creed that we heard, I, I believe in the smartphone. <laughs> Maker of Instagram and Apple Pay. And I believe in iPhone and iPhone 11 at Sun. And I believe in Spotify and, what's her name? Alexa. <laughs> Who tells me where to go and plays the music that I like. So the sermon is not meant to be a rant on that. But it's simply a call for divided souls in a culture to put some guardrails so we can enjoy the beauty around us. It's a call for a divided soul to please come home. Please come home. Because in our age, in this age, and you never know when the headline will hit or the tragedy hits in your own family or you get the diagnosis, those things are not enough to hold you in the depths. And when that's all we're used to, that's immediately what we'll go to. And it's very hard to find another way. In our age, we need to know there is a God who's acquainted with our suffering and our grief. <laughs> and sometimes our suffering and grief is just to put those side, things aside for a while because we feel the pain of it. I really mean that. But we need to stop dressing our wounds and find an ancient path. To stop putting duct tape and band-aids and come home. So I want to I want to consider uh, two ancient paths this morning. One is our creed, a creed. There's two primary creeds in the Church of Faith, the Church that followed Jesus Christ. It's the Nicene Creed that we saw in the bumper video, and there's the Apostle Creed. And then I want us to consider our prayers in a way that we pray, in a way that we can kind of bring in a sacred rhythm of prayer. So creeds, creeds are, are ways of saying what we believe, because sometimes we forget. Oh, we know we believe in God, but we forget his impact in our life and what he really means for us. See, our creeds tell us who God is and who we are in the story. And if we can kind of uh, brush off the ancient dust and see it for us today, We'll see that they're not rituals meant to appease God and make him think better of us. In other words, it's not like, I want you to do this, you'll be a better Christian. If you do the creeds and think that makes me a little bit better in the faith or a better Christian or God will be pleased with me, then you don't understand the gospel. God is no longer angry with you. 
He is not looking for your works of righteousness to get to him, because the Bible say, for God so loved us that he sent his son. And this is love, not that we keep trying to get to God, this is love, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for every time we fall. If we think of creeds as a way of getting to God, then we don't understand the gospel. The creeds are not obligations to put us in right standing with God, but they are invitations to declare what you believe, to clean out the mess, to clean up your room, to put the stuff in the drawers and say, okay, now I can see again. They're an invitation to declare what we believe and to live in the radical grace of Jesus Christ. And all it becomes is more fuel for your fire. Not a way to get to God. So the creed we heard before this message is a Nicene Creed. The church, the early church in 325 AD, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they came together to write the Nicene Creed because there was this weird thing in the gospel. They kept talking about the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So they wanted to put it together and say, we believe in the Trinity. We believe that there is one God, but he expresses himself in three people. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed does that. It reaffirms that. But today I want to look at the Apostles' Creed. It was not written by the apostles, but again, about 300 or 400 years after the apostles, it was a summary of their teaching written by people in the early church. It's like the whole New Testament wrapped up into one idea. So if you're not a big reader, just memorize this. You got the whole New Testament, basically. And behind these words are 2,000 years of people of faith, of Christians, saying, I believe in something that will hold me in the storms. In saying these creeds, we are connecting with the God that the people in China, the people in Western Europe and Eastern Europe and Africa and Asia, all over the world have connected with God in this way. You may go into a church somewhere else in the world and not understand what they're saying or not understand the, the language, but somehow you begin to recognize, wait a minute, this sounds like, in the rhythm of it, a creed. I know this creed. I can say it in my language. It's like being here at Hope, and some of you guys, especially, we sing these songs, and the notes go up in the air, like, oh, oh, and so you stop singing, but then they come to the hallelujah part, like, hallelujah, <laughs> and you can connect. And that's what the creeds do. It's still used in most churches around the world. And it goes like this, and I'm gonna put some commentary in it so you understand the pieces that might be a little bit like, whoa, what's that mean, okay? So a declaration of what we believe, not a way to get to God, but a way to be catalytic, to fire up who God is in our life. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. That means I don't believe that I created myself. That means I believe somebody was behind the big bang that created everything. And I believe that he's a personal God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. So when I sometimes think, okay, creator, who created me, I'm not sure you know what you're doing. It puts God on the throne and me serving him. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, important, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Boy, a summary of the gospel. He descended into hell. Ooh, what's that mean? That's a whole sermon. There's some debate there. But Peter, one of the early followers of Jesus, one of the apostles, and so remember the later church wrote this in. Some traditions don't use that line. We still do, I still do, because I believe in the radical grace of Jesus Christ. And the apostle Peter says that Jesus descended into the place of the dead to still preach to those separated from God. The dead metaphorical, meaning you are just dead away from God. 
he descended into hell, it says. And the third day he rose again from the dead, which means God did raise him. Just like that first song we sang, what a beautiful song of power. And it gives hope for us. And then he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty and says, trust in God, trust also in me, because I have gone to prepare a place for you. And then he sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Ghost. In other words, that he is present, he is in us, he is around and the Holy Catholic Church. The word Catholic, here as they wrote it, is coming from the Latin meaning concerning the whole or universal, not the literal Catholic Church. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord, I need a reminder of that every day. <laughs> the resurrection of the body and a life everlasting. All right, so for those of you that are new with us, for, for those of you who are thinking, okay, he's a little intense this morning, I'm gonna give you a break. I'm going to let you breathe, and I want you to stand up. Now, give a back rub to the person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's what we did in student ministry. We're not doing that this morning. It's inappropriate. I've been told that by our HR. <clears throat> All right, so um, you may be new in faith. You may not believe these words. Um, so thank you for standing, and you don't need to say them, but if it's something that you can express belief in, Listen as the rest of this body um, says these words. We're going to say the Apostle Creed together. Okay? All right, church, here we go. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell, and today he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe. So be it. Have a seat. Thank you. Okay, if you're, I don't know, let's call it 30 or under. Last service I said 21 and under, and all the U of R students are like, well, I'm, you know, I'm like 22. I, I'm in between. But if you're 30 and under and you're a little newer to the church, or you're newer to the church, here's why the creed's important. Okay, we just talked about how it connects us with God, but it does sound a little ritualistic. It, it's not. It's powerful. So here's why the creed is important. The first reason is, especially you young people, it's countercultural. You want to rage against the machine, then declare a creed. It doesn't conform to the pattern of this world. It's an ancient path that connects us to Christians of all ages and around the world. You could sit with grandpa or grandma and they might know this creed, and it connects you. It points us to a cross and says, you're going to find meaning in your life, not by just trying to get everything you need and get into the right schools and do all that kind of thing, but it points you to a cross that says, okay, to find my life, I've got to lose it in Jesus. Remember, we talked about, hey, let's, maybe the answer is not all the rationale, but just getting near to Jesus and letting him lead us. This creed says, I chose to trust God who, who raised Jesus from the dead, and I'm not going to trust me. Because <laughs> everything I create keeps falling down. And then the second thing that this creed does is it makes a stand. It summarizes what we believe instead of what we want to believe. It says, from thence he shall come to judge Oh, that's not a nice word today. Don't judge anybody. In a world of evil, somebody needs judging. And the one who made the heavens and the earth will redeem everything. And he will forgive our sins, but he will judge evil. The creed says that there is eternal life. 
and miracles can still happen. And finally, this creed points us to Jesus, and, and Jesus is pretty cool. He's the almighty God. He's a wonderful counselor. The creed reminds us that we're not alone, but we're in a communion of saints. And the real centerpiece of the creed, it's not a doctrine. Uh, listen, the, the real centerpiece is not a doctrine or a certain way that this denomination believes. The real centerpiece of the creed is a name. And at the center of this creed is the name of Jesus. And there is life in that name. The Apostles' Creed is an anchor in a drifting world. We believe. And so the second ancient path I want us to consider today are breath prayers. Breath prayers were started by the ancient desert fathers and mothers. These people lived about 300 years after the birth of Christ, and they withdrew in a busier and competing voice culture into the desert to try to hear the voice of God. And they believed the breathing was connected to the idea of spirit and thus God. For instance, in the Hebrew, the word for spirit is ruach. That word can be defined as either spirit and or breath. In the New Testament, the word for spirit is pneuma. That word in your Greek dictionary can be defined depending on the ending and such. I'm getting a little too like back in the seminary here, forgive me. It can be defined as both spirit and breath. So see how they put breath and spirit together. So a breath prayer connects you to God. Mike Cosper in his book, Recapturing the Wonder, says, the beauty of the breath prayer is in its portability. I love that. We all got to breathe. We can take our breathing anywhere we go. There's no place, no meeting, no encounter in life where we can't stop and take a deep breath. I take a deep breath every morning when I get up. And my wife says, oh, you have another hard day, don't you? Because my deep breath my, is not a prayer breath. Like, ah. Oh. <laughs> so I want us to change our breath prayer a little bit. From, oh, I had a roommate in college who groaned all the time. His name was Jim. Make sure you sound like Jim. <sighs> so I want to invite you to practice three breast prayers with me this week. And I did them for the different stations of the day, the normal watches of the day. Here's the morning. Ready? Get up. You got to orient yourself. Okay, I got a lot to do. I got a task. I, I, I'm worried. About. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. If you work out and you got a lot of oxygen in you, one of my favorite breath prayers is a little longer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, set up your kingdom wherever I go. And then here's the afternoon prayer. This is when you're in meetings and you got to go into a meeting you don't want to go into or you got to have a conversation you don't want to have or maybe you're in school and you haven't studied for your test. Here's a good breath prayer. Lord, be with me. Or if you haven't studied for the test, Lord, have mercy on me. <laughs> Another prayer like this, especially if you're in the real world of real difficult meetings in your workplace. Be still and know that I'm God. And then finally at night, I woke up last night, couldn't go back to sleep, so I started to practice the breath prayer. It took me about a half hour. Lord, I'm tired. I need rest. Lord, I'm tired. Give me rest. Lord, I'm tired. Give me rest. That's out of Matthew. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. See, a breath prayer keeps our day from getting away from us and reminds us that we go nowhere by accident. A breath prayer is like throwing a rock in a calm body of water and seeing the concentric circles go out and affect every part of our day. It expands God's work in your life. It's a spiritual rhythm that you can take to work or to school or around the house. Now, 
in the last two services, I said the Apostle Creed and the breath prayers are available at the Connect desk, but obviously a lot of people needed to breathe, so they took them all. There's none left. <laughs> but they are available online, and we'll have some more here for you next week, okay? They were just, they're just little cards, I mean portable, so you can have them, both with the Apostle Creed and the breath prayer. Maybe you want to add your own breath prayer to the list. Maybe you just want to write a couple down when you get home today, like, Lord, help the nationals. Lord, help the Steelers win on Monday night. That's called a sinner's prayer. That's, that's not really a breath prayer. Okay, let me close it up. Last Saturday morning, when she was here at the last service, I did a baptism in the James River. We're not preaching through the baptism in this series, it's a, but it's an ancient practice. It was for Laura, a mom with young children who was headed to MD Anderson in Houston for life-saving surgery. She wanted to be baptized, and it was important for her to be baptized. When life feels fragile, we need to know there's a greater power within us So we went to the river with a communion of saints, her two young children, and her husband. And it was cold. (laughs) But when I mentioned it to her, she said, I want to feel it deep in my bones. Laura wanted to experience an ancient practice to remind her Jesus would hold her in the depths. And there may be some others here this morning with a difficult diagnosis or whatever it would be. The sacred rhythm, the breath prayers, the creed are not magic, but they remind you that Jesus is very near. I think Jeremiah's voice speaks loud and clear to us today. We're at a crossroads. Stand at it. Look for an ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest. Lord, give us rest for our souls. I believe. I believe in God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, And I believe that God raised him from the dead. And it's never too late for me. Let's pray. So our Father, here we are. And we will leave and we'll get a text or we'll see a picture from a friend at a game. And Lord, we pray that we would not live under judgment that we would enjoy the things that you've given us. But rhythm with you, declaration of you, prayers throughout the day would remind us who we are. In Jesus' name, amen.